want to tell you that I am very excited about this morning. And as you look around, we have gathered kind of leaders from throughout county government here. I think this is a very exciting opportunity, and I want to thank, this is both Sarah Colleen's uh, kind of initiative, she came up with the idea, and guilted and recruited everybody to be on the panel, uh, and did, did both of those very effectively. The reason why this is going to be important, I think, for us is the Centennial Accord, which we're going to get some in-depth um, knowledge of and, and history behind and implementation, all that's going to be kind of very important. But it represents a really pivotal point in the relationship between the state of Washington and the federally recognized tribes. You know, it, and we kind of forget that. We kind of think of history. We think of the tribal relations as to where they are today. But I think this is going to be really helpful to kind of go back 34, 33 years, talk about what they were like, what brought about the Centennial Accord, the Centennial Accord and then what has changed since then. And, and just, I don't want to take, steal too much thunder, but for the most part, you know, if you go back, if you're like me and you, you grew up here, you remember the Bolt Division, you remember the fishing wars, but you may, it may be hard for you to remember that the state's relationship with the tribes was, was exceedingly controversial. At that time was, a lot of times things ended up in courts, which was bad for everybody, and there was that recognition of it. And it was under then-Governor Booth Gardner, former Pierce County executive, from, so from our county, uh, under his leadership that there was really a pivot of the relationships from, from kind of court-based and, and one that really didn't fully recognize the sovereignty of tribes to one that was more collaborative and cooperative and fully recognized the sovereignty of tribes. It really represented that. So that was this pivotal point. And it was not only pivotal in the state of Washington, but I think you could say it was pivotal throughout the other the nation. It was Washington was kind of leading in that point of transition and recognition of the sovereignty of tribes. And other states, some other states, kind of modeled their actions after the Centennial Accord. So I think all of this history, that is why I think it is worth everybody in this room's time to sit down and, and get refreshed with some people who lived it and to give us some incredible perspective on it and then think about what, what does that mean about how we operate in Pierce County today with our tribal partners. So I think it's a, we have a, just a tremendous opportunity for you this morning. So with that, I would like to, A, first of all, thank Sarah Colleen. Thank you very much, Sarah Colleen. <laughs> And it's my pleasure to iterate our moderator. He has a challenging job today to moderate these gentlemen up in front. Um, Bob Whitener, who is from our own Squaxin tribe. So Bob, welcome and thank you. Thank you for joining us. Good words. And, and again, thank you, Sarah, for uh, inviting, inviting me to do this. I, I, it's a real honor to moderate those three. I'll just start with that. And I'd really like to thank Pierce County for allowing me to speak in your building and to be part of, part of this for you, too. Um, as Bruce said, you're from, we, I like that you call this one of our tribes. Um, because you're truly in, in this spot, looking at where Medicine Creek, the three tribes, we all operate, we all fish right out there in Chambers Creek together. So it's kind of a unique place for the Medicine Creek. And Medicine Creek was the first treaty run. I just <laughs> thought I'd let you know. That. Just saying. Just saying. So I'm really happy to be here. And, I, and this today should be uh, really interesting. Um, and the progression in the Centennial Accord was sort of a defining moment. I mean, it, 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 it didn't, in and of itself, doesn't really create the, the true coordination and work that tribes do. I mean, it's a very specific 
relationship with the state of Washington and its agencies, but it really sort of shows what can be done. Um, and and, and Mel is going to talk about what it was like back then, um, and and he's going to try to to convey, you know, the history in a very short period of time. And I know Dick is going to talk about the mechanics of the accord and, and there, and then Ron's going to kind of take it home. You know, what does it mean today? How, what does it mean to you? I mean, why do you need to know how to work with a tribe? Or is it important to know how a tribe works? Or, you know, sometimes people don't even know who to call it a tribe. How do you, how do you get there to, to, um, to work with it? Because, you know, Tribes are like you, we're governments, and we have our own ways of looking at the world, and they're different from tribe to tribe, and it's not always safe to just walk in the building, you know? I mean, so this is a really good um, to take the time to do this stuff. Now, on the cooperation and practice, I'm going to morph that into really um, question and answer so we can talk about it together rather than just these guys talking. They, they all thought that was a good idea. And they want to hear there. But we will re not do the questions until they're all three done, because each one of these topics could generate enough questions to go on for days. So we'll, we'll work it toward the end, and we'll try to end at noon. But I want to introduce our first speaker, Mel Tenasket, in the great nation of the Colville. And um, his history is, in, and by the way, the bios for these three are all in your packets. They're a good read. Uh, most of it's true. <laughs> Mine's true. So I'll, I'll introduce Mel, please. <laughs> Mel Tanaska. This is a, a test for an old man. And I, you know, I got out of the business like 30 years ago, 32 years ago, I think it was. I'm not tough like Ron. I, um, so I haven't ha even had to really talk about the Centennial Accord for 30 years. So when you ask the questions, that's the guy, because he's still doing it, right? He's still doing it. I'm the historian, I guess, because I'm the elder at the table. Um, I was born in 39 in an old government hospital on the Colville Indian Reservation. I think it was an army hospital at the time. And so I've got to see a lot of a lot of changes. I grew up in the mountains, and uh, I really didn't know downtown. I didn't know what it was like around really other people except loggers out out in the mountains. And and when we moved into town, when I had to start school when I was seven, it was a it was a shock. I mean, it was a situation. I was a little Indian boy little half-breed Indian boy coming into the town of Omak and being told, get back on your own side of the river. Omak is divided by the Okanagan River, non-Indian on the west and Indian side, reservation side on, on the east side of the Okanagan River, and our border runs the thread of the river. And I never heard that kind of talk before. I, and I didn't, it got me a, to, to learn to adjust that you don't travel across the river by yourself you have to go with other kids because it was fight time it, you know you, if you travel alone you're going to get beat up we've actually had i seen cops tell indians to get on your own side of the river um when when we did move into town my my mother is re was really fair really fair looked like a non-indian and and we went into look at a house and the landlord said, was willing to rent it to us and mom said you got to wait till tonight when my husband gets out of off work and we'll come back if that's okay and I was there and so we went back that night it was dark and we opened the door and he seen mom and he was okay and he seen my dark skin full-blood dad and uh, he said I'm sorry the house is rented already and that's how that's how we started in Omac, right? And then never did change. When I got to move away from Omac to Grand Coulee, um, which was right at the end of the construction era, 
I was still doing some third powerhouse and developing the reservoir down uh, the Columbia Basin. It was different because we had some uh, uh, black kids there that were wound up being blood brother. We had some Indians there uh, from the Spelum. I had a different experience there, and I never wanted to leave Grand Coulee. Okay, and so back at, um, in the, most people don't know it, but during President Eisenhower's time, he, that's when the termination era started. It was his policy to terminate all of the federal tribal relationships, whether you had a treaty or you were an executive order. And our tribe was on the list to be terminated right after the Klamath tribe down in Northern California. And when I came out of the service, I went to work for the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs. And I could see how the Bureau of Indian Affairs was working with the state on um, what I thought uh, was pretty crooked. Like the BIA superintendent was like the godfather. You couldn't even develop your own land, your own allotment um, that was in your name um, without the approval of the, of the BIA superintendent. And what he would do is he'd tell the old people, and I seen this because I worked in the, what's called the IIM, Individual Indian Monies. I, I, I'm the one that wrote the checks, whether it be leasing, forestry, or whatever. I wrote the checks for the people. And I seen our elders who couldn't talk English. We had a lot of them back then in the early 60s that couldn't talk English. And so he'd get them to put their X on a piece of paper that would take their land out of trust, and then they would lose it to the state on, uh, for taxes, right? And they didn't know why. Or he'd take money out of their account to go buy them a house somewhere that wasn't even part of their, their family's territory, so they wouldn't live in it. I mean, I just seen all kinds of stuff like that. So I got mad and I quit. My, my wife about divorced me for quitting because it was a federal job and it was security, right? And, and so I moved back to OMAC where I swore I'd never live again because that's where the termination leadership was elected mostly out of. And I started going to the city council. How come there's no Indians working in any of your stores? Went to the counties. How come um, nobody's working in your county offices? Uh, how come we make up I don't know, close to 80% of the population for, for the reservation, and that's in Okanagan County, yet 90% of the people in, in the jail were my people. How come 90 plus percent of our children were, were um, failing in their, in their public high schools in both Okanagan and OMAC? What's going on? I mean, are we that dumb? Are we that bad? And, uh, this lady by the name of Lucy Covington, who is my hero besides Ron and Joe Delacruz, and Dick Thompson. Uh, what about Squawkson? <laughs> Cal Peters. Cal Peters is my brother from Squawkson. He used to bring me clams. Um, she, this Lucy Covington, who was on the council and would sell a cow, to fly to Washington, D.C. to fight termination, come and ask me if I would run for council. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm not a politician. All I know is ask questions. And so she talked me into running on her ticket. And that's when I really got to learn what was going on. I got to learn percentages of, of what was going on and what our history was like. And I really started watching, not as a kid anymore, but as an adult. I, we would film um, in East OMAC, State Patrol, pulling my people over and, and waving white people through constantly, right? We would film that. And then the smart ass cops would wave at us because we were filming it. We seen, well, we counted, I wasn't supposed to say smart, or was it the other word? <laughs> Uh, but I can't help it. That's what it was. And then you, you, when you know that 
you've lost about 300 of your babies or more being adopted out by the state of Washington and lose, we're losing them. We, we just didn't know where they were because the state had adopted them out. And, and we never got to keep track of any of that sort of stuff. I mean, it was just things like that, just the um, constant turmoil, uh, not being able to get a job in OMAC. The only ones that we could get was out in the woods, carrying a chainsaw, driving a cat, um, maybe working construction on the dams, but nothing at home, nothing. And so we found that probably, not probably, we had like 86% unemployment on my reservation when I got on the tribal council. We needed 450 new homes because we had as high as four families living per dwelling. I found that we had about a $2,400 annual income for a family of five, about 4.5 size. I mean, how do, you, how do you succeed like that? Right, I mean, when people, it's almost a joke when they go to an Indian reservation and they see junk cars and they see a messy yard and not much of a lawn. They make a joke out of, oh, we're in Indian country. Well, I was lucky enough to get to work with a gentleman by the name of Chief Dan George. You know that name? He did a few Indian awareness days at high schools, and I was lucky enough to get to go to a couple of them and present too. And I heard him say once about that issue, about you know when you're getting into Indian country. He said, you know when the beauty of the soul is dead, why should you have an exterior beauty that does not match it? That's what it was like. That's what it was like. And so you wonder how come we had so much alcoholism, losing people to, to uh, now it's drugs, but <clears throat> excuse me, before that it was beer and rot gut whiskey. And I seen it, I seen it. So got to talking to other tribal leaders um, like Joe, Ron Allen. Joe Delacruz, if you don't know, is from the Quinault Nation, who is gone now. But we got to talking in a hotel down in uh, Olympia about the, all of the stuff that's going on on our reservation, reservations around the Northwest. And, and yet there's times when we had to work together. You know, if we're, we're, if we're gonna deal with um, delinquency, we should be working together. If we're gonna deal with not having a lawless territory, we should be working together so that uh, whether they're Indian or non-Indian felon can bounce back and forth across borders to stay free. That hurts us all. What can we do to keep kids in school? How can we influence the schools and the counties to help us and we help them? And uh, because when our kids are in school, the schools are making money, federal money, right? Per per student on count days, federal impact aid monies. So there's areas that, that we need to work together, should work together on, yet we're fighting over taxes. Firecrackers, for Christ's sakes. You know, I mean, why would you fight over a firecracker? But we did. You know, who should get the money for selling a firecracker? Um, fighting over um, children, of course. And even though we were lucky enough to get a federal law passed called the Indian Child Welfare Act, the states, um, including Washington, really didn't follow the, that federal law very good that, that gave the, recognized the jurisdiction of tribal courts over, over their Indian children their, their, and their descendants. So that was a fight. And so when we were talking about all of this stuff, well, what can we do? We need to work together on some things, and we need to fight like hell on other things that shouldn't jeopardize one or the other. And we're always fighting over who's the most sovereign, even though we're the most sovereign, <laughs> right? We're the most sovereign. Look at your, your Washington State Enabling Act. Look at it, because they don't teach it in high school. And I don't know if they teach it in even law school, but look at it, because 
in order for the people of the state of this state now to become a state, they had to agree to not interfere with tribal, with, with the tribes. They had to agree to that. Did they live up to that agreement after they become a state? No, because that's why we're fighting over these jurisdiction and our children and school and everything. No. And we were here before the state was, was um, made a state. You know, my tribe was, it's an executive order, but was later um, approved by an act of Congress, was 1872. So we've been here a long time. We had our own, we had our own legal system. We had our own way of taking care of our kids, and it was all gone. In the 30s, it was gone for us. I don't know when it happened to the tribes on the coast, but when they built Cooley Dam, it just completely destroyed our tribal government systems. We never even whipped our own kids until then. We had a, a whipper man whose job was to go around to the different homes to see if the, a child needed to have a whipping so that the parent wouldn't have to whip their child. We had a salmon chief. I imagine you guys probably had the same thing. Um, a salmon chief whose job was to, because we were on the Columbia, that was our main food and our tra trading commodity, to make sure that every family had enough salmon to last till the next run. So he had the authority to take salmon from those that got a lot to those that didn't get very much. So everybody ate, right? That's the kind of a uh, um, tribe we had and the Spokane's had and those that I know over in our part of the country. But when you start fighting, uh, it just turns everything upside down, upside down. And so one night, I don't know why we were in town, but uh, I can only remember, and I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm old and forgetful, but I remember we was in a hotel, Joe Dela Cruz, Ron Allen and me at the beginning, talking this stuff. God, I'm tired of fighting. It costs money. Some of it we're fighting for nothing, and yet we have to go and sit down with people and work out uh, the things that's good for both of us. Can we agree that write up something that uh, the state is no more sovereign than us and we're no more sovereign than them? Can we write up something that um, says, now I'm being a smart aleck here. I took that other word out. Uh, <laughs> that you're taller than I am, right? You're better looking than me, or I'm better looking than you. Because that's what fighting over firecrackers was to us. It was stupid, stupid. Can we write something up where we can make these kind of agreements? Um, and it was a salmon time, too. That's when I met Jim Waldo, because he was trying to help mediate in that. And I was, my position was, stay out of it, Jim Waldo. You know, that's up to the tribe and the state, not up to banks and other businesses. It was up to those governments to do it. That's how we met. That's how I remember it. Um, so he was always a peacemaker, and we're still friends, ain't we? Oh, as of a week ago, as far as I know. Okay. Because <laughs> I could outrun him until I had this pacemaker put in. No, I can't. So anyway, that's, that's what got us to a document. And when we were done jawboning and wishing, how I remember it is that Joe did most of the talking. He was a good talker because he was smart and he had a hell of a memory. And Ron had this really heavy laptop that I think was one of the first laptops or first little computer you could carry. It was heavy. And he was sitting there being pretty quiet, and my job was can call me a liar, but I, my job was like that when Joe was talking. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I agree with that. And it got to the point where, God, I wish we had that in writing because that sounds pretty good. And Ron said, how does this sound? And all that time he was working on some language. And, we, and so we talked about it and didn't hardly make any changes about it. And then we brought it over to the governor's office and, and brought it to, to my friend over there, 
um, who was a chief of staff at the time, and said, here's an idea, what do you think? And he took it to the governor. And so then I kind of lost track of it. Um, I burned out. I don't know how Ron keeps going. I burned out in 89. I couldn't, I just, I was done. And so I left my tribal council and went to work for the Indian Health Service and started working in the health field and running clinics and then eventually worked for Dick Thompson again. Yeah, instead of going and telling him what I wanted, I had to go to Dick Thompson, please. Please, can I go do this? Please, can I do that? He hired me to be like the Indian desk for him in the Department of Social and Health Services. And, uh, I, I think he did a heck of a job, and, and, and that program is still in effect. I don't know how they're doing, because I ain't nobody no more, so I don't go around telling what you should do what you should do. But what you should do <laughs> is pay attention to the Centennial Accord, because that's, that, that's the roadmap of how governments and entities can work together. And that's what we all need to do, isn't it? No matter what the, whether it's state, tribe, whether it's city, tribe, whether it's tribe, tribe, whether it's state, feds, whether it's Republican, Democrat, it don't make no difference. We gotta work together. And that's what this whole document and the whole purpose of this Centennial Accord wound up to be. So I'll be ready for some questions, but make them easy, please. And the real questions is to Ron. He's, He's, he's a kid that still has a memory, and if he don't, it's all on his computer right over there. God bless. Thank you. That was perfect. I, it's, it's amazing uh, to be me, because I got to grow up with these guys, and Joe Dela Cruz, and, and, and Sarah. Sarah is amazing in Indian country as well. And, and Ron, we were a little more contem sure. contemporaries. Um, but it, it was an education that I have that I wish everybody had. Because no matter how bad Mel made that sound, it was worse. The, the, the history's not good. Um, it just isn't. And, uh, and Dick Thompson walked into a uh, I don't know what you call it, a hornet's nest. I mean, if you, if you went back, you know, during Bolt, and it's, I find it interesting today how people know about it, but they don't, they don't think of it as a, a, a climactic or a, a heavy, intense thing. And, um, and these treaties, which not all tribes are treaty, and I think there's some other things in here. First, there's tribes, federally recognized, uh, future in the, and through a process, through Congress. You know, a lot of ways we become tribes and sovereigns. Um, treaties actually, in some ways, are limiters on some things, because it made it really clear what we gave away. And on other things, like fishing rights, it was good that we were able to retain those. And I know you guys work in an area where fishing rights are, are a big deal. And it, it was a war. I mean, it wasn't a little thing. It, it, the U.S. Department of Justice said this is the only other um, court case besides Board of Education where states just said, we're not doing it. And, it. and it was war on the water. People were shooting at each other. You know, I've been shot at, chased by a hose, dogs sicked on me. You know, Fox Island was a scary, scary place. Um, you know, so, so Dick kind of walked into the middle of this. So we, he walked into the middle. We, we used to have court cases like we had 350 federal decisions to run a fishery in one year just to kind of get it. And this is just the fishing side. The same thing's happening on social services. Same thing's happening on fireworks. Um, cigarettes. Cigarettes was a war. There's all these things that we're now trying, you know, to fix. And, you know, cooperative management and fisheries kind of started it you know, because we kind of had to, because this was ridiculous. And, um, but at the time with Booth Gardner, there, there were glimmers of what the future could be. Um, but I just want to emphasize how rough it was and what a monumental task Dick's going to tell us about. So could you do that for us?
Thanks, Bobby. <clears throat> we'll get back to him in a minute. <clears throat> uh, uh, first, I actually uh, looked at the uh, agenda, and I don't think my resume is in there. Uh, and uh, so it's probably because I've, I, I actually saw one that Sarah did, and I was too lazy to do any more. So. <clears throat> it is in there. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's under Dick Thompson. We couldn't oh. find an updated picture. Oh, you couldn't find a picture. Oh, okay, good. Well, so, <clears throat> so that gives that, again gives a little background. My my wife hates it when somebody says, "What did I do?" She moans. <clears throat> uh, she first says, "How much time have you got?" Uh, and then and then she next thing she says is, "Why don't we just tell you he couldn't keep a job?" Uh, <laughs> uh, which is probably pretty true. Uh, so, uh, actually. I, I wish I could could get as, deserve as much credit as, as Bobby's just given me, but I, I really can't. Um, interestingly enough, uh, part of that career, uh, 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 that that bio, is that uh, I, I'm a lawyer by training, uh, and was both a city attorney and city manager uh, in the cities of Snohomish, uh, uh, Everett, uh, and then Puyallup uh, in the early '80s, and my time in Puyallup was identical, I think almost to the day of Booth's time in the county. He got elected county executive the same time I started as city attorney, and a few months later I became city manager, and, and we did a whole bunch of stuff together. Uh, uh, and so that led to our relationship that, 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 uh, that, that moved me on to the state, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I actually want to start with some thank yous. Um, certainly a thank you to Sarah for, uh, for all the effort that she's done to put this together. Uh, and then to the leadership of, uh, uh, of Pierce County, not only for all of you that are here and have, have been interested and, and, and are engaged, and I think that's really important, but something that's actually important to me that I asked, my kind of the one thing I asked from her, uh, uh, and, and actually she mentioned that, that my name came up um, uh, between Mel and, and, uh, and Ron, and I says, well, you better get Bobby here too. Uh, because uh, he's a key player uh, in all this, and unfortunately Bob Turner, who we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but my, my wife is, uh, is actually a national expert in historic preservation, was, a, was the former uh, head of the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation for the state of Washington, and is a huge believer uh, in oral histories. Uh, and I am not aware, Ron and I, 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 I think I've done this dog and pony show a couple times and different kind of things, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not aware that any of it has ever been recorded. Uh, and I think it's important, I, 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 know that, I know that Sarah thinks it's important for training. I think it's important for history, and I make my wife happy. So, <laughs> so, so you know, that all works pretty well. Uh, so, so thank you uh, uh, for, for uh, allowing this to happen in the way that I, that I, I really appreciate. <clears throat> I, uh, I kind of walked into this thing, uh, uh, literally walking into my office. I, uh, my background uh, uh, includes not only Puyallup, uh, uh, where Booth and I did a lot of interesting things, but my first job in state government was the director of community development, which is now called Commerce. And then not too long after that, I became chief of staff. I didn't have the history of an early meeting that, uh, between the tribes uh, and the governor where not only did cooperative management and some other things came up, but the issues of sovereignty came up. Um, so it's now, that would have been in 85. So it's now 88, uh, and, uh, uh, and the, a meeting's going to occur between uh, uh, tribal leaders and, and Booth. Uh, I'm chief of staff, and my, uh, the, the head of policy at the time was a guy by the name of Kurt Smith, who had come out of fisheries and been involved in that. Uh, and, and I saw the briefing document for the, for the governor, and it was all about fish, and it was about uh, uh, gaming, and, and, uh, uh, and I think cigarettes, uh, uh, and some of that. Uh, and I had to go give a speech somewhere, and, and so I arrived back at my office to have Kurt sitting in the office waiting for me, and proceeds to tell me that when the tribal leaders came in, uh, Booth was all ready to talk about the stuff that was in the briefing thing, and they said, no, we want you to see this. And it's that document that Mel talked about. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that I don't know exactly what transpired, but the bottom line was Booth kind of sent them to me. Uh, 
Um, and I had the I had their draft of the they gave me their draft of the document, uh, and looked at it and went, what what's wrong with this? You know, uh, 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 actually, what I knew was that even though it doesn't didn't use the term, it was really a statement of sovereignty, uh, and it was all about government to government. And you have that document. It's it's called the Government to Government Proclamation. You have that in your packet. And that was, believe it or not, that was important for two reasons. The first reason was it was the first kind of formal statement. The problem with it was it was unilateral. It was a proclamation from the governor. Uh, <clears throat> and the second reason that it was important is it was a commitment. Uh, and it was a binding commitment that the governor made that was not going to change. When I first looked at it, and I thought about it for a couple of days, and, and I actually noticed, and the one thing you see in there is there was nothing about, it was all about government to government that the tribes had, that the state had the responsibility for. There was nothing in there about the responsibility that the tribes had to the state. For And, and, and there's a there's a one paragraph that's added into, and I think that is the only change in the entire document. But I walked into the governor's office, uh, and uh, I called him boss, and I said, boss, you know, uh, uh, this government to government thing uh, that, uh, uh, that, that, that I'm working on, and, and I said, interestingly enough, uh, sometimes we have annual issues. Sometimes we have decade issues in terms of the policy issues that we were dealing with at that time, health issue, health care issues and other kinds of things. I said, I think this one is a century issue. And I've said, I said, we had a century to screw it up. Let's work on the next century to fix it. And, you know, if Waldo wasn't here and Bruce wasn't here and I don't know the others, I'd make up what Bruce said, but I can't remember. And they, if I made it up, they'd know uh, that I'm faking it. But it was something to the effect of, well, let's just get it done. Let's, we've got to make this happen. Um, uh, uh, and I said, yes, boss. Um, now, the other things were going on at the time. Our term in the, in the Garter administration was Indian fighters. And we had in, in both wildlife and to some degree in fish, which were actually it was Department of Game, I think, at the time, and fish. Uh, had had some folks that were still very unhappy about it, and we had some folks in the Attorney General's office uh, that were still Indian fighters, still trying to find ways to to, to relitigate Bolt. Actually, one of them, one of those, became a Supreme Court justice in the state. Um, so, kind of, how are we going to do this? Um, and, uh, and 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 so we actually uh, uh, got it done, got agreement. With the, with the one change that we made, uh, with, uh, uh, with, with what actually I ended up in a meeting with who else but Mel, Joe, uh, and Ron, <laughs> you know, the, uh, uh, the three amigos, <laughs> uh, and, and came to an agreement. Uh, but we really, when we put it out, we really, it was intentionally not intended to be a big deal. Uh, we thought it was a pretty big deal internally, but was, it was it was really not. Let's let's not. Legislature was divided. Uh, leadership. There were some in the legislature that wouldn't have been terribly happy with it. Fortunately, one of the interesting things is we had, the governor had just hired Chris Gregoire about six months earlier. Uh, to the, to, she was uh, one of the two deputy uh, uh, attorney generals to to run the Department of Ecology, and I. I called up Chris and I said, help me weave my way through the Attorney General's office. Because we're not going to ask their permission, but I'd kind of like to know where I can kind of deal with this. And, and she sent me to a guy by the name of Ed Mackey, who was really the operational guy for, uh, 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 for the Attorney General's office for years. Uh, and and I was, he was OK. We, 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 I, I think he wanted to change a couple of commas or something, but, but, but he, he was OK. And so we, were, we knew that at least at that point, uh, we weren't going to get a huge pushback from the attorney general's office uh, when we did it. So now what? We've got a commitment in writing. 
from the governor. But how do we institutionalize that? And actually, some others may have had good ideas. I didn't. Uh, you know, we, just, we, we weren't quite sure what the next step was. Uh, and we were conscious that 1989 was the centennial for us. Uh, and so, 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 so the discussion came up about, and I think internal, I don't remember Booth being involved with this, but internal about, you know, how do we tie this to the centennial? How do we, how do we kind of have these, these two things happen at the same time? Um, and the other thing that we understood, and you don't have to read very far into it, that the, the, no, let, let, me, let me back up for just a second. <clears throat> I, I, I had made a, an agreement with the head of OFM. For those of you that don't know, the Office of Financial Management <clears throat> is, uh, 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 is essentially, the, the head of, of, of uh, OFM is essentially one of the two deputy governors. The chief of staff <clears throat> is responsible for the operations of state government and, and for kind of uh, working uh, more directly with uh, with the cabinet, uh, the OFM director is responsible for policy and budget, and so we were going to switch uh, between the two of us, <clears throat> but we needed to make a change at the Department of Social and Health Services, so I volunteered to go to the Department of Social and Health Services for six months uh, to help kind of uh, uh, figure it out and actually to, to to work on the question of this huge umbrella agency. Uh, the $14 billion budget, 19,000 employees, uh, with literally everything in it. We were only one of two in the country. Florida was the other one that was a true umbrella human services agency. And, and in many cases, human services are as much a responsibility of the counties as they were in the state at that time. So mental health and, and, and developmental disabilities and some of the, some of the, uh, uh, of the then welfare programs, AFDC, were run by the counties, they weren't run by the state, but in Washington state, it was this, it was this, this, this uh, uh, big umbrella. So it was part of it, what, what should we do with, what should we do with that? <clears throat> Unfortunately, I didn't get to come back. Uh, the governor, after about five months said, hope you're enjoying it because you're staying there. Uh, and so then I, uh, I ended up for four years there. So I was not real directly involved in the actual negotiations of the accord. But the one thing that we all underst we understood and he understood was this was all about government to government relationships. And I used to say to everybody when they didn't understand this, if Washington had a problem or an issue with, with British Columbia, what would happen? Well, the governor would call the premier. Uh, and the fisheries director would call the fisheries director. <laughs> and I said, why is this any different? And how are we going to institutionalize it? Um, and I, I had, uh, Jim mentioned uh, being into a couple of meetings at governor's house and stuff, but, but, but and I did that too. But for me, what it was, was, <clears throat> sorry, Bobby, we, I, I called it uh, Bobby squared or Bob squared. Uh, the, the, the two, he and, and Bob Turner, really had the responsibility uh, to find a way to draft and institutionalize this document, which was then going to become an actual agreement, uh, not just a proclamation by the governor. Um, and they did, obviously, a, a marvelous job. I, on the other hand, know what's coming. And I'm going, we have to be in the leadership here with regard to implementation. <clears throat> so it's not true that I begged Mel on my knees, only one knee, uh, to leave Indian Health Services and, and come and lead uh, our Office of Indian Affairs I said, I'll get you six people, you can put one in each region, uh, to be able to do that, which we taxed the whole agency and, and, and did that, uh, and were able to do that. Sarah was already there in Children's, I guess, because and, 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 we had all these issues that you don't think about. You think about fish, and you think about gaming. Well, what about Indian child welfare? And what about actually 
uh, uh, issues with regard to AFDC and, 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 who, can, and who can run that and, and, and those kinds of issues. Uh, and to my very, very good fortune, uh, Mel agreed and did a marvelous job, put a, put a good staff together. Uh, uh, and we were able to, I think, kind of hit the ground running more with regard to, to the implementation uh, of, of, the, uh, 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 of the accord than a lot of others were. Uh, uh, and I really, I really attribute that to Mel. And, and so, so how did we do it? So on, the, on, on literally almost the day of the centennial, at the Burke Museum, uh, the accord was signed. Now, the interesting thing is, I was just reading the government to government proclamation again. It says 26. I think there were 27 federally recognized tribes. And if you read the accord, only 26 signed it. And the one that didn't was the Yakimas, the Yakima Nation. And I literally was in negotiations with them, not on the accord. It was nothing was changing in the accord. On, on kind of what it would take to get them to sign it, and we just couldn't get over the finish line. And there was a lot of history uh, uh, with the Yakimas of other treaties that they'd signed that hadn't worked out very well, and all their leadership got, uh, got dumped, and they were worried about this happening again, and, and uh, I couldn't do anything to fix that. But, uh, but actually, I think that they have they've participated in, 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 uh, in the tribal uh, accord meetings since then. I had the opportunity uh, after I'd left uh, to, uh, to facilitate a couple of those, of those accord meetings, only to find out how far and how fast I was aging out of, uh, of Indian country. Um, and, uh, but, but so, so for me, kind of today is a little bit like the proclamation. This for us was a commitment. Hopefully today this is a commitment for all of you uh, uh, to work on the next steps. Uh, it, it's, it's not easy. Um, Bobby made that real clear. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, and it, it doesn't itself fix the substantive issues. It just tells you how you can. It tells you the mechanics of how you can do that. Oh, I forgot to mention, I have some colleagues here from uh, different lives, uh, including OFM that I expected them to heckle me and I was gonna tell you just throw them out, you know, uh, that they're now, they're, now, they're now with Pierce County. Um, so, so thank you, I, 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 it's got nothing to do with ego, but I'm really, really happy that we will have this, uh, this oral history recorded uh, and so that it can be used in the future. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I, 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 I forgot one. I looked down at my notes, I forgot one thing. <clears throat> so it's, the, it's now 1992. It's, it's in the summer of 1992, and at, we're at a, at a cabinet retreat, and Booth springs on us that he's not going to run for a third term. Um, and I don't even, Denny Heck was the chief of staff at the time. I don't even think Denny knew. Um, and so the question came up, well, you know, how we, this thing's not gonna stay quiet very long. And he says, yeah, let's, let's do a press conference this afternoon. <clears throat> so all, we, we disbanded this retreat. We all went back to our offices and I was not there. <clears throat> but somebody in the cabinet said to Booth before he left, he says, well, you better think about, you know, uh, what you're gonna say and, you know, what, what you're proud of. <clears throat> and, 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 I mean, literally his first year as governor, he really was instrumental in settling a Seattle teacher strike, which he was very proud of. In his second term, he spent enormous energy on health care and trying to get something close to a basic health care plan. In fact, we did during his time do uh, um, a health care plan for working poor uh, that, that was done and a bunch of other stuff. When he got asked at the press conference, the first thing he said was the Centennial Accord. Thank you. I will, I will say that I, I always thought we kept the Bob's secret. Um, 
<laughs> Not sure Indian country would be, they might have been a little alarmed <laughs> at what we were doing. I uh, really appreciate that, Dick. And, and, and I do remember drafting with, with Bob Turner, and, and Bob Turner's a lawyer, so my role really was to keep him straight, not really the drafting. Um, but many times he would say, kind of like that TV show, better call Dick. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm sure he did. Oh, well, I got almost daily updates. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So don't, don't underestimate his participation. Um, that, that was, a, it was fairly heroic what they did. You know, he, he talked about it a little bit, but they, they got attacked by the people that didn't want to do this. I mean, it, it was, there was bloody warfare in the, in the state internally between each other and the factions within. I mean, it was getting so bad, Ron, they were starting to look like an Indian tribe. <laughs> and so I want to introduce Ron Allen. Ron, Ron and I go back a ways. Um, one of my dearest friends and a mentor. And he's kind of like introducing uh, James Brown, you know. <laughs> The hardest working man in Indian country is Ron Allen. And I don't think, you know, a lot of tribes will argue about Ron, about what he does or what he did or whatever. But that's the one thing we won't argue about. He is the hardest working man in Indian country. And he knows more about all of the things in Indian country than is humanly possible. Um, and so, you know, normally you don't give somebody this great of an introduction but I don't know any way to, to express it other than to do that. Ron, Chairman. Love you. <laughs> Thanks, Bobby. Um, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm very honored that Sarah talked me into uh, to doing this uh, and with Mel and, and Dick to, to reflect on uh, what we've achieved over the last 33 years, as Bruce said. Um, it's been quite a journey. And uh, uh, it causes me, uh, I get a little emotional about it because it's something that I'm quite proud of being a part of. I was, a, uh, I was one of the younger, greener uh, chairman at the time. I got elected in 1977, 75, I was on the council. And so, uh, and I was trying to figure out, you know, exactly what can I do for my small tribe. And um, I figured out really quick, you know, that Joe De La Cruz from Quinault Nation and, and Mel Tenasca and Mel Sampson over down at Yakima, uh, uh, Cal Peters at uh, Squaxin Island. Uh, so there was a number of tribal leaders that, that were out and about, and uh, they were really, really well known. We're, um, uh, I'm really proud of, of um, the tribes here in Washington are national leaders. Mel is, is the youngest uh, uh, tribal leader to ever lead uh, the National Congress of American Indians, where all the, tr uh, the 570 plus tribes c come together for policy at, at the national level. And, uh, and he, he was a, a young tribal leader that, that come out of the Northwest. And shortly on his heels was Joe De La Cruz, became the president of NCAI. And there, uh, out there at Macaw, there was a guy named Bruce Wilkie, who was early before uh, Mel's time, um, was a big part of it. Uh, Cal Peters from uh, Squaxin Island was a, was a huge tribal leader in the, na in the national front um, in engaging with the state, of course. And, and then we, we had a number of others. Uh, I could go down a long list from Tulalip and Lummi and, and uh, Swinomish, Tandy Wilbur, for anybody who knows Tandy Wilbur from the Swinomish tribe. It's <laughs> extremely well, well known. And, and you know, Mel talked about Lucy Covington, who was just a, a huge player in the Northwest, um, fighting for uh, uh, her sovereignty. So, uh, you know, the, when you, when you want to talk about the accord, um, you are talking about sovereignty. And, uh, and we were having lots of fish wars because of the Bolt decision. And there were also all other issues that, that the tribes and the state was challenged with, and the county governments were challenging us, local governments, as, as, the, as the growth of, of the Northwest kept, kept growing. And, and pretty soon, tribes found themselves surrounded by um, the development and the growth in, in, in the Northwest. Uh, many of us were definitely out, out in, the, in rural communities, and, and we didn't have the same kind of experience, but, but we did have um, a challenging experience. <laughs> so I think it's important to recognize that um, uh, sovereignty is the foundation. Uh, Senator Inouye, a good friend of ours from Hawaii, who, who chaired the 
Senate Committee on Indian Affairs for many, many years, used to always keep reminding us, without sovereignty, you have nothing. So we talk about treaties a lot. You know, you, you always hear about the treaties, and treaties are the supreme law of the land, hands down. Um, that's how we won the boat decision, you know, and, and, uh, and so that is critically important. But you don't have treaties because treaties are just contracts between nations. So it's because you are a sovereign nation. <clears throat> so when we had those conversations that Mel was referring to, um, uh, there was, it, it was just Mel and Joe and me and Larry Kinley from Lummi Nation. He was the chair of Lummi Nation back then. We would have that, that conversation about what it was. And, uh, and I was a, a bit of a, a Wilma Mankill from Cherokee, always referred to me as the cyber chair, you know, because somehow I got into the high tech world uh, uh, as a young chairman. And, uh, and so um, I migrated fast from the old IBM Selectrix to one, two, three, and then, then you, you could actually change it, you know, change the verbiage before you hit, hit go, you know, and, and then on to like, uh, uh, Mel was talking about <laughs> the big compact computer. The IB, IBM and, and, and Compaq were the first two that came out with these huge, quote unquote, lot, laptops. Not exactly laptops. <laughs> so, in fact, you set them down and you got these little tiny screens. For those of you who can remember, those little tiny amber screens or, or, the, uh, uh, or the, um, um, the other color, amber and uh, the green color. And, uh, and we migrated. I mean, it's, it's been uh, interesting going from the um, latter part of the 20th century into the, and now the 21st century and how fast we are. And, you know, I can, I can see, you know, the PDAs, right? Where, where would we be without the PDAs now? But uh, the Accord, um, so yeah, we sat down and, and, uh, and I, was, I was young and trying to I listen to the basics of the sovereignty and the relationship, et cetera. And, and Mel says he was quiet and nodding. That's not quite true. <laughs> he, he, had a, he had a lot to say, and, and he was groomed by uh, Lucy and, and, and his mentors out of the Covial Nation. Um, and, uh, and, and Larry, too. Larry was, was a bit of a philosophical kind of a leader, but Joe was a table thumper. And, <laughs> and he went on and on about what had to happen. And so I was just taking those notes down like crazy um, in terms of what it was. And I knew we were going towards a commitment. And none of us quite knew what, what the commitment was. And so we did hammer it out. And actually, I did. And, and so I, I was running it, running it by Joe and Mel and, and Larry. And, and, and Bobby came into the mix. Uh, uh, he was also a, a young uh, a tribal. He was actually on the council for a while. And he, he, was, he was a executive director or something like that for, for uh, Squawks. And, and he remember, uh, Rob, Bobby also was a executive director for Northwest Fish Commission. So he's played a lot of different roles. Anyhow, uh, so Bobby, people like Bobby were around to take a look at our language and the way we were structuring it. So, you know, you, you started with the fundamental philosophical premise and the foundation, but then you had to turn it into something practical. It had to make sense day to day, you know, and so we were in court fighting all the time and, and uh, over whether it was fish or jurisdiction, et cetera, like they were saying. And so we had to have a better relationship. And it had to start at the state level and then, and then move on beyond the state level. But um, we, we, uh, as, as Dick was saying, we had to institutionalize it. And so, you know, we were kind of going, okay, how are we going to make that happen? And who's responsible? You know, and so um, we, 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 kept, we kept breaking it down. And, and I was a bit of an organizer. I've always been a bit of an organizer and a structure kind of guy. I didn't have legal training like uh, lawyers did, but, but I was organized enough to where I knew we had to kind of structure it, and we juggled it until it made sense to us. And, uh, and so we got it done, uh, bottom line. Uh, we got it done. You know, and, and, of course, 10 years later when Chris Gregoire was, was the, uh, the governor and we did the, the, the Centennial Accord, which just reaffirmed it, what it did. It just reaffirmed the commitment, the, uh, the, uh, the, the cooperation, the collaboration, because when we started, we got it done, and uh, yeah, it was a challenge to not get, well, try to get Yakima on board. Uh, and Yakima was just afraid of, that they were trading off their sovereignty or their jurisdiction, their authority. That's what they were worried about. It wasn't doing it because the way we structured the agreement, it was unequivocally clear that we are not relinquishing. There's a clear disclaimer. You did not relinquish any of your sovereignty, your jurisdiction, your authority. Uh, but we couldn't persuade the uh, Yakima Nation, uh, and uh, they have their own uh, complicated uh, uh, political council structure, and we couldn't get across the fishing line, finish line. 
But we got everybody else on board, and it was a, it was a great, great uh, day um, in, in 1989. And I, I agree with Dick, you know, that what was it? Uh, we didn't want it to be a treaty because we felt the treaty was at the highest level. And so this is at the state level. So let's bring it down a little bit. We debated about MOA. And, and, and so the accord kind of jumped out at us. And so we went, OK, that worked. The accord works. So uh, we did get it done. And, um, and so we, uh, and we structured it so it had to happen every day. So the first 10 years, um, um, Dick and Bobby, you know, it was not, you know, all of a sudden people started realizing, wait a minute, what's this deal between the tribes? How does this work? What's my obligation, et cetera? And it got a little complicated for every department. DSHS was a big one. Fish and Wildlife, what's their responsibility? Uh, you know, public safety issues, and on and on down the line. It, was, it got a little, little edgy on, on how is it going to work. Because in the accord, it was, you're accountable. We're going to come back every year. And we're going to talk about what you did or what you didn't do. And what are you going to do next year? So, uh, so we, we, we put it upon them. And so we put it upon the, uh, the, the, in, the, in, the, in the accord. Who's responsible? So if I, as a tribal chair, I got, I got a beef with, with, with the state over some issue, who do I go to? Chief of staff. So right away, we said, chief of staff is answerable to the governor. He's the executive branch. We didn't have the legislative branch. That was a separate subject matter later on that, that evolved in this whole relationship between the tribes and the state. But this was an executive branch uh, obligation because that's where the action was, in all these different departments. And so we wanted to make sure you come and talk to us. Give us an annual report. How'd you do? What did you do? What did you not do? And then we can put on the table uh, our concerns, our beefs, our issues, our compliments. And, and then so, OK, what are we going to do next? It, it, it was a little dicey uh, uh, in the first 10 years, um, but we did it. We did have a meeting every year. We did come together. It, it, took, it basically took two, two days. And it got a little challenging because in some of these areas, they're complicated. So you can't, when you go over the mountaintops, there's details that you've got to have. And so we end up breaking out uh, uh, task, task groups and work groups to follow that up because it was relative to fish and wildlife or relative to DSHS, relative to the DOH and, and, and some of the other agencies. And so we had to have follow-up uh, efforts to make that happen. Then, they, then the next year, then they were uh, responsible for reporting back, how did we do? Uh, did we do anything uh, better or uh, different? So that, for me, uh, that was a, a huge issue for us that to make, this, make the accord um, meaningful. I can tell you, as, as one of the architects of, of it, um, it was a great experience. Bob, when we got out of that meeting, uh, we already had it somewhat drafted up. And then, and then uh, we got this small meeting with Booth. And Bob Turner was in the room. And they said, you and Bob go back and look at this thing. So Bob, I, did, I didn't know if Bob had to vet it with the AG. Um, and that, that was interesting that we got through the AG at the time. Um, but uh, we did. Uh, and I think that a lot of it goes to Bob and, and Kurt and, and the others who were, were navigating uh, on the state side. But um, Dick is right. Um, somehow we got it right and, uh, and we massaged it. We were smoothed it. We, we grammared it to death um, and, uh, to make sure that it flowed smoothly, clearly, and, and it, there was a clear paper trail in terms of our, our unique relationship. Because every tribe is different. What the Cobbiel tribes needed, what Squash and I needed, isn't the same as Jamestown all the time. And so we had to have it unique to, to the, the, the collective, but then also uh, relative to uh, a tribal specific. So Puyallup has their issues here in Pierce County. Whole tribe has a different agenda out there in the coast uh, of, the, uh, of the state. And uh, so we had to have this thing workable and, and a good relationship. And, I'm, and I, I get asked all the time. Uh, Alaska tried to, uh, tried to mimic it. Um, they couldn't quite get it through. And, and it has a lot to do with the relationship between the tribes and the state and the state leadership. Do, 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 they, uh, do they have a good relationship? And if they're contentious, it's hard to make it happen. The, the, the high value here in Washington, we, have, we were blessed with far more progressive leadership. People who look, who stepped back and, and went, basically the, the relationship between us and Indian tribes um, uh, is not really, re is not respectful. 
uh, and, and quite frankly, uh, they had a, a, a terrible history. So we can talk about all the different terrible histories that, that we have in America, whether it's African Americans or Asian Americans, et cetera. But the indigenous communities is the longest history of, of injustices. And this state was far more progressive. And we're lucky we had, uh, unfortunately, we had a governor that was very progressive. Um, and he had a team that was very progressive and allowed us to put together this accord and structure it a way that we got, we kick-started in 1989. And then every year after, it kept getting better and better and better. You can't solve all your problems. And, and so part of my challenge, uh, quite frankly, as a leader who's always been there for, for many, many years, is keep it into perspective. You, it's just, it's not going to change overnight. You know, and uh, uh, it's like some of us who work in the natural resources uh, arena, you know, and man thought he should straighten out the rivers. And we, and we said, no, yeah, that was a dumb idea, right? And, and took a, it took, takes a lot to get the river back to its original, original uh, 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 ground or, or trail. And um, those kinds of things happen. Uh, we're fighting over riparian zones right now. And so, um, and so the issue is, is how do we make these adjustments? And we knew in 89, at the end of the 20th century, that, that Washington State was an attractive state, east side mountains and west side of the mountains. And so, you know, well, how are we going to deal with that growth? And we're dealing with it right now. You're dealing with it here in Pierce County. We deal with it in our rural communities, et cetera. And so as we're moving our agenda forward, it ha we've always knew that the accord was relative to balance of nature, growth, and human needs uh, in, the, in our com community and society. And I, I think the spirit of the accord is, is something that, that, that works. Um, there aren't any other state that I know of. I, I, I work at a, at a very high national level. I've been in and out of states all over, all over the U.S. Um, they've had variations of it. New Mexico has a variation with their Pueblo tribes and Apache tribes and Navajo Nation down there in New Mexico. They have a, a unique little structure down there. Maine has, has Indians actually on their legislature, but they're non-voting and, and things like that. So they have their own approaches on how they're going to do it. Nobody has an approach like us. Nobody has an approach that, that requires the state you know, to, to, uh, to meet, meet, meet with the tribes on a regular basis. Now, what does it mean to a county? It means that you can take the spirit of the accord and do it yourself. So, you know, it, uh, how, I'm not sure who, uh, I know Pialop is here, but I'm not sure if any other tribes overlap into the Pierce County. Um, but, you know, the, uh, as Bobby said, you know, the, the Medicine Creek tribes, you know, have a, have a territory um, that overlaps into Pierce County. So you can have meetings, you can have structure, you can formulate relationships, <clears throat> you can meet with them. Uh, out in my area, I, I, my tribe is out in the Limit Peninsula, in Clallam, Clallam and Jefferson County. My tribe meets with the county commissioners. My tribe meets with the, with the, de de the, the heads of the development and the heads of, of the different agencies with regard to different matters. So you can, you can dial it down and you can have meetings and talk about why you have mutual interest. You, you, and it works. It can work. You can be. You can agree to disagree. It's okay. It's okay to agree to disagree, and and find the find the common ground. Find the way to make it work. And and that's that's really what the accord is about at, at a state level. And then and then we just say you know like Sarah asked you about the county yeah, here in Pierce County. It's, it's unique because of how how big the Pierce County is and how many people live here and and then what goes on. It, there's ways to find common ground that, that, that you can make it work. That's the spirit of it. And we are part of the solution. You got to remember now, uh, where we were 40, 50 years ago, it was a linear relationship. Tribes, federal government, got treaty obligations. That's our relationship. You guys, you BIA guys, you Indian Health Service guys, you guys over at HUD, you, got, you have a duty to us. You made a commitment in these treaties. Well, I can tell you as an example, because I, I work at, at, the, at the federal level with regard to um, the, the resources at the federal level that reaches tri Indian country. Right now, th there's this OMB cross-cut analysis, and, and there's about $28 billion that goes out to Indian country every year. We conducted our own analysis uh, categorically from healthcare to housing to transportation, public safety, uh, natural resources, and on down the line. And the need is well north of 250 billion a year. 28 billion, 250. That's a huge gap. 
And so you got tribes saying, I'm not going to do anything here until you honor this commitment and this obligation. Our, my argument uh, and to my colleagues has always been, the only way we're going to bridge that gap, because the, the 250 a year is the, is the true need of Indian country, just to be at the same level as, as mainstream America, is going to be us. It's the self-reliance agenda. So when, when the accord hit in 1988, it, uh, uh, in 1989, when it got passed, same years, Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. Same year, the, the Indian uh, Self-Determination Act. So all of a sudden, tribes, were, the, the vision of the Mel's and the Joe's now was starting to be realized. And all of a sudden, we started believing in, in that we are governments. Joe's favorite phrase was, if you say you're a government, then act like it. And we would go, okay. That meant we had to get our political, legal infrastructure in place function like a government, no matter how big and small you are, and do what you can in order to function like a government and, and interface with the other governments in a resp responsible, respectful way. And so when you move out of the 20th century, and gaming did something that, that, is, that has not been, ha been as successful uh, as any other effort by the federal or state government, is helping tribes become more self-reliant. 28 billion to 250, you have to find ways to get unrestricted revenue, businesses. It's not just casinos or hotels or golf courses. It's other kinds of diversifying because our people are just like your people, so to speak, when I say the non-Indian community. You, you have a different set of people who have uh, different vocations and professions and interests. So I don't want to work in a casino. I'm a fisherman. You know, I don't want to work in a casino. I care about education. I want to teach kids, you know, that kind of thing. So we have to, we have to figure out how to diversify and find those kinds of opportunities for our, uh, for our people. And that's what started happening in the end of the 20th century. Now you move into the last 20 years in the 21st century, you've seen a phenomenal success, phenomenal success. So my, urgent, my point about the, the linear, okay, so all we had to go is just go to D.C. and deal with our issues in D.C. But now... We are part of the solution. So now the state government, the local government, all the, 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 the educational institutions, they all care about our, our, our interests. They want to know what, they want us to be a part of the, 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 the problem solving. And so now you find our people being dis dispersed and you find your energy being all over the place in, in terms of trying to cover a lot of different bases because they care about our thoughts about public safety and, and education and health care. Um, like my tribe right now, we just spent $17 million for, for an opiate and substance abuse treatment center outpa out, outpatient program. Okay, we did it. I didn't get any money from the feds. I, I did get money from the state when I went to the state for it in, in my area. And, and so I, my, my guys said to me, okay, maybe if we go get seven and a half million for you, you're going to get skin in the game. I said, well, first thing is, okay, it, uh, I, it's my land. Okay, so I got, I, I, you know, and, and that's where we're going to we're gonna, we're gonna build it. And then, and then at the end of the day, it cost me another $10 million. I had to go find another $10 million to solve a problem that, that, that serves all of us. This is not just an Indian issue, but we're part of the solution. That's just an example. I did the same thing with our health care. I'm a small tribe. I got 535 people today. I hope nobody's passed away or anything. But, but uh, we're still 535 strong, you guys. Um, Anyhow, when I build a clinic, I can't make a clinic work with 500 people. I wish that only probably 400 live in my community, and the rest are spread out everywhere. So we opened it up to the non-Indian community. And Virginia Mason bails. We stayed. So one thing about any country, we're not going anywhere. We're part of the solution. So I built a, we built a, a clinic. I borrowed money to build a clinic. I persuaded a whole bunch of doctors to come, come work for us. I now staff a, a, a clinic that is, has about 140, 145 employees, 26 doctors, and I'm serving over 20,000 people. I can Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP programs, you name it. We are all doing that. We're, that's the solution. You know, we, need, we, had, we, had, we needed a fire uh, uh, station in our end of the county. The fire department, you know, everybody fights for money in order to cover different needs. So they come to us and say, we, we want to serve your end of the county, but we have no money and, we can't, and, and we're being pushed out of our small little um, uh, matchbox of our, our property. We built it. You know, we would turn around. Went, uh, this, this is like 30 years ago, 25 years ago. And so we borrowed like back then, uh, four or five million, and we built them one. 
Okay, and we and bought a fire truck for them, you know, and so and then and then the ambulatory uh, uh, facility. So we contribute. We are you're going to find that everywhere. Now, some tribes have a lot of resources. Some tribes don't. Some tribes are just better organized and they have more resources. And they're more successful. Hands down, what Puyallup Nation is doing is amazing. What they're doing is amazing, guys. Uh, it's just the stuff that they're doing for their community and, and this community is amazing. I, I did, you know, it's a hands down. And, and the, their diversification of their economic portfolio is, is very impressive. But you go to the whole tribe, you go to the Kulia tribe, you go to the Macaw tribe, um, the, the market is limited. So broadband capacity, infrastructure, uh, we're a part of the solution because we want them to have jobs out there. That's the new world. And, and COVID has changed our world because now, you know, teleworking works. You know, it has challenges, but teleworking works. And so all of a sudden now you can, you can, uh, you can do those kinds of things. I just want to say that, that uh, the Accord put us into a new environment here in Washington State. We are a model. Um, there's nobody like us um, out there. And uh, uh, are we perfect? Absolutely not. We are working towards, towards perfection. We all do that. And, and so and that, that's, what, that's what my memories is. Uh, you know, Mel and, and Dick and Bobby and, and, uh, uh, and, and some of our, our allies, our, our, our colleagues who have passed on, um, we built this relationship. And we built it with patience and respect and, and, and uh, a, a sense of, of how to make it happen. So we always talk about stuff where it's not how, to, how why not, but it's how to. It's an attitude. The accord is an attitude. The accord is that we can make this happen. We can show that to our Washingtonians, we can make this work better and, and for the betterment of, of all of our communities, urban and rural. And uh, I'm just proud to be a part of it. And, and uh, um, I, I, I blame Mel. Uh, when I got involved in, in the 70s and 80s, and I quickly looked to people like Mel and Joe, and uh, they pushed me into the front row. And I had no idea that, that what they were doing to me. Um, so I, I got into this fast lane, getting involved, and, they, and Mel kept telling me, it, sometimes you just got to do what the people are, ask you to do because it's your time. And I thought, okay, well, he's my, he's my esteemed leader, so I'm kind of going, okay, I'll, I can do that. And um, next thing I know, I'm in this fast lane. Next thing I know, I'm in this Zoom lane. Now we're out of COVID, and there's a faster lane somehow, and there's no off-ramp, you know. <laughs> so anyhow, but I, it's been an honor. I, um, it's been an honor to, to work with these guys and an honor to be a, a part of this solution and this very unique relationship that we share here in Washington State. Thank you. Thank you. Now you, you kind of get a sense of what I was talking about. Um, you know, we want to try to take this next section into you know, what's nuts and bolts questions. You know, what can we do in terms of relationship? And, and, and Pierce County, of course, does work with the three tribes and, and does work with us well. Um, but we could get better, obviously. There's more things to happen. And, um, you know, the progression that these guys are talking about Really, when they talk about self-governance and self-determination, you know, my brother's a lawyer, a professor at University of Washington, and he has a picture of uh, Nixon in his office. And you might say, why, why does he have that? Well, he took us out of termination into self-determination. So some of our heroes aren't who you might think. Um, and so it's a complex world we live in, and you guys work in this, and, and uh, are trying to figure out how to do this. And for us, even though we're the oldest governments here in the United States, we started with really complex, well-ordered governance. And these are governments that your, our Constitution of the United States are built upon. They were very complex. But what they did is they stripped us of all of that. And we had governments that were reduced to being bossed around by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which does stand for Boss Indians Around, it's in case anybody doesn't remember. It, it, but it evolved in a very short time for, to self-government. And, and people go, well, that's kind of a scary word. Or sovereignty, that's a scary word. Nah, not really, if you understand the definition. It's the ability to make your own decisions about your own people. Like, where do your kids go to school? 
Can you imagine your kids being picked up, bused far enough away that you can't talk to them, being told you can't call your parents? They might come home. They might not come home. They don't come home. There's no explanation for what happened to them. I mean, this is a, this is a change that is amazing. So we do get emotional. Sorry, Ron. <laughs> and, uh, but I think it's also really exciting to be part of the, the change because it has changed. And, and it's better for a government to have a better government to work with. And so these government to government or these kind of discussions are good for us to grow as a government in this world and for you to have a better understanding. So let's go to questions. We have a, a roving mic there. So anybody have a burning question? Anybody have a question? I'll call on people. I'm not afraid to do that. Jim Waldo has a question right up here on the front, front table. None of us have an answer for Waldo. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm so glad you guys came and said this, and it got recorded. Um, I guess for the future, I'd underline one thing, and that's relationships. You got to work at them, you got to build them. People have to come to trust each other. And as one of you said, don't always agree on everything, but you don't, get, let, you don't let that get in the way of agreeing on the next thing. And when we all started, you were talking about tough times. <clears throat> I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office. We had to take over the fisheries. We brought in marshals from around the country. People were shot. Boats were sunk. We had to send FBI agents out to protect the tribal fishermen so they could walk down the dock and get on a boat. So when you talk about how bad the history was, it was very real. And I can remember with some of the early meetings, tribal leaders said, we can't go have a negotiations meeting. Those led to pretty bad things in the past when we met with the white guys to negotiate so we can have discussions. And I remember Dick's boss, Governor Gardner saying, what's our political strategy to have this Centennial Court survive put it out in public because he knew people were going to go after it. So I think it's just a tremendous accomplishment by all of you. And I also want to thank Bruce and his team because there are a lot of local governments that wouldn't make this effort. So I think you never take for granted the people that want to do the right thing. So thank you. I don't know if this thing's on, but uh, uh, <clears throat> we, we, we were conscious of, of the political issues uh, uh, literally from the time that that uh, we were, the, that they presented uh, in 1988 the governor with what became the, the government government proclamation. <clears throat> and actually, it was I think Ron. It was actually it was when I was talking about uh, the AG's office. I was talking about. It, at the time of the proclamation, not at the time of the accord. And, and what seemed to happen, uh, uh, because we never got huge pushback, um, uh, uh, and, and partly probably because there was no key substantive issue right dead in the middle of it. I mean, I mean they were all there. Gaming was there, and, 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 and uh, uh, they were all there, but, but nothing kind of overwhelmed us at the time. But it was kind of like, it seemed like that people kind of got used to it a little bit. Cooperative management was going on. Uh, 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 the, the, the proclamation was out there. And, and it, the, the, we, you know, we were watching the noise level. And it, it, it wasn't real high. And I, 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 I'm not really sure why. Uh, but I've, I've attributed it to kind of uh, just, just being slow and patient and not crowing about it. Uh, not, not trying to kind of make a big political success story out of it at the time. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we, it got pretty close to that at the Burke Museum. <laughs> but uh, but it, was, it was an effort to kind of get this done. And, uh, and, 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 and we, we were watching 
a lot of the Indian fighters uh, to see what was going to happen, and and, uh, uh, and and I think we were probably pretty lucky uh, to uh, to be able to have have it uh, come through. And, and and literally after a couple three of the uh, of the accord meetings, it had become institutionalized. As far as I'm concerned, it was it wasn't going to it wasn't going to end. It wasn't going to change. It was going to keep going. Mel, I. Uh... We, we refer to um, Indian fighters. There was also white fighters, and I was one of them. Uh, when I first came into the business, uh, like I said, Lucy Covington was kind of my, my hero, and the first thing she did my first year on council was send me to Olympia to learn how the state of Washington functions, to go meet people, Find out who those individuals are, who's the bosses, what's their personalities like, who do they like and who don't they like. I spent my whole first year on the council in 1970 doing that. And I wound up, of course, with uh, uh, Governor Evans. Um, and eventually we even got a uh, Governor's Indian Advisory Council under Dan Evans. And that's when it really started. So I wound up being a state hater, uh, and so it was unbelievable to me that I wound up working for the state. You know, I mean, <laughs> that made was... made an offer he couldn't refuse. <laughs> yeah. I... Let me just add two things. That story about Mel, by the way, and Lucy is on YouTube. If any of you ever want to go pick up that piece of history, it's available. It's worth watching. But the other thing, Mel's right. He was really an obnoxious, difficult son of a bitch <laughs> when I first met him. Yep. Um, you still are. Well, <laughs> I was trying to be charitable, Bobby. Um, but I remember what changed him was when he saw people meeting him halfway. Yeah. I remember you telling me that. You, yeah. It was the opposite of your OMAC experience, I think. Yeah. yeah. You said, these are people who don't have to meet me halfway. Yeah. Yeah, I, it was an eye-opener for me. The longer that I was in the business, I realized that if it wasn't for non-Indians, termination wouldn't have been beat. It was eventually the population of this country, the majority white, that said to the feds that termination is wrong because they seen the experiences of it and other reservations where termination happened. If it wasn't for non-Indians standing up uh, along the beaches and watching the news and saying beating up Indians out on the river or out in the sound isn't right, that might have not stopped either. I mean, so, and it was like during President Andrew Jackson's time when his policy was extermination, extermination, not just do away with their government, but do away with the actual body of the person. If it wasn't for the population of this country, that would have happened or that would not have, have stopped. And I learned that, and that made me kind of soften, that I needed to go out and tell a story to the Minon Indian uh, audiences that I, wherever a chance I got to go to, whether it be grade school, high school, colleges, or the legislature. You're not my enemy. We're in this together because we're like the miner's canary. That's what I was told. We're like the miner's canary, even though we have treaties even though the Constitution of the United States recognizes us as special because they can treaty with us, even though we have those rights and we, we can own tax-free land, we can be tax-exempt, we, feds are supposed to provide education, health, and housing through those treaties, which they do a little tiny bit compared to need, it, it, it really hasn't happened. So. I needed to go out and make friends eventually. That's what I learned, that the population is my enemy. There are some enemies out there, but they're the minority. But the majority have to learn what, the, what, what is right and what is wrong and what is history and what ain't taught in school, because it never taught me nothing about my people and what my people went through. You know, I didn't really realize that the people that my dad used to go over to Seattle down on Skid Row and laugh at people that were down on Skid Row was my majority at that time Alaska Natives. Why were they there? They were there because the federal system 
was taking them out of their country and putting them in supposed in training schools or vocational schools, usually in Seattle, Los Angeles, out in the big cities and not telling them how to live. They were abandoned out there. You know, there's a story of a, an Alaskan who came down and he was lost and he, so he had a number to call and they asked him, where are you at? And he said, I'm on the corner of go and don't go. He had never seen a stoplight and he was lost. That's what they were facing, right? So what's their alternative? I mean, when you lose that spirit, what's the alternative? And so I went from this enemy of the state to somebody that goes out and preaches, hey, we can, we can do better. We can do better. And I think it was like, I don't know, maybe two years ago, two and a half years ago, a Republican a representative from Republic, which is a town that isn't known for being Indian friendly, introduced a resolution in the, in, in the House to recognize Mel Tanaskett for his work for his, his tribe and the tribes of the state of Washington. And it passed. And so I got this award. I don't put it up on my wall because I'd rather see my wife and my kids and my grandkids on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it shows you what can happen when you, when, when, kind of like the light comes on and the right people are talking to you about what, what can happen. And um, so it's been a hell of a journey for me. I mean, God put me, I say this a lot, God put me in, the, in, the, in this world, in, in this Indian world, at the right time in history, the right time with Indian leadership. As, as Ron said, some of the names that I got to work with and he got to work with, the right time in the state le leadership, when I got to work with the different governors and, and my friend Dick Thompson, I wouldn't have went to work. I wouldn't have went to work for DSHS if it wasn't for him asking me to come and work for him. I wouldn't have done thank it. You, thank you. Oh, <laughs> I was easy. <laughs> I Ron. ain't no more, but I was then. Ron would like to respond, and then we have well, another question uh, I just, over here. Uh, to, to add to um, both Dick and Mel's uh, points uh, um, about the spirit of cooperation, Billy Frank, everybody knows. I don't know anybody in the state, for the most part, doesn't know Billy. And, and Billy was like Mel. He was fighting on the rivers, protecting his treaty right. And, and then why are, we, why are we erecting a statue of him in the U.S. Capitol and one down in Olympia? It's because he shifted like Mel. He shifted from um, a fighter for his, his indigenous rights um, to one to find common ground. And, and that's why we recognize right. him. That's why we, we deeply appreciate him. He was, a, he was an amazing, charismatic leader. Uh, he was not a tribal leader, but he was a tribal leader because of his standing, his relationship of natural resources, which was so important here in Washington State. So uh, I just think he, that is a, a, is a really important example. And I also want to add one, one, one success story in my backyard that is an example when it comes to county governments. In my, in my backyard, um, you, uh, in, in uh, Clallam County, uh, uh, is, there's a big ag industry, and we have this, all this huge spider web of irrigation system. And the irrigation system for the ag industry um, was draining the river at the worst time of the year, right now. You know, July, uh, July September, and October, when, the, when, when they need water for, the, for their ag industry, and, and we needed water for the salmon. And so we were at loggerheads. That was a problem. It took us 20 years to build the trust and the confidence between us and the county government that we were on the same page. And so we, we were okay with the ag needing, needing water, but we wanted to culvert it so it was not leaching anymore and you use the water more efficiently. And I remember uh, this one county, uh, uh, she became the uh, chair of the county uh, uh, commissioners. And she didn't trust us because we had the talent, we had the skill, we kind of led the meeting. And uh, she got, uh, you know, these Indians are up to something that's not good for us. Um, and so I told our, uh, the, the, the person I appointed uh, for, on behalf of the tribe, let her lead. Let her be the chair. Let her do, we'll step back. 
So, so she took over, but then all of a sudden she realized this is a lot of work. And, and, and I don't have the horsepower and the back, backing to do the work. You know, maybe we ought to give it back to the tribe. You know? And so we did it. And, we, and basically that spider web is more efficient. Ag industry is happy. They get their water. Um, and uh, and we, we got a better uh, uh, river you know, for our salmon. So it, it's a win-win proposition. And, but the most important point that's also part of the spirit of the accord is build the trust. And, and relationships. I, I, I would totally agree, Jim. Relationships. You get to know each other, you know. And the, the one bad thing about Zoom, you can be, you can be a little distant, you know. And it, it's a great value for new things that we're doing now in the 21st century. But it's not the same as when we get to sit and talk to each other and have a cup of coffee and uh, get to know each other. And you develop that relationship, which builds the trust. And we do have another question. Right. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Allen, one of the reasons people drag you out is because you're a brilliant translator. So anytime I see you're going to speak, I try to pay attention because you're going to explain a lot of things. I was hoping that this, this panel might talk a little bit about tribes in the present tense because in a lot of history books, the tribes are taught as though it's ancient history and you're doing a lot of important work that is interacting with the broader society. And one of the translating questions we have in Pierce County is, of course, we have an enormous Asian population. We have an enormous Hispanic population. People literally speak a lot of languages. And there's also a lot of intermarriage between groups of people. So there's plenty of translating going on. But I would hope that you guys could talk a little bit about what you're doing to raise the profile of your tribal groups as modern participants and how, you, and you talked a little bit about things you're doing specifically in your tribe, but there's, there's this notion of the tribes as an historic artifact as opposed to a current living group. Well, while you, while you all are, I'd like you all to respond to that. No, even you, Dick. Um, awkward, oh. but, but, uh, I, but I do want to say this first. It's really important to be cognizant of what in Indian country call erasure. Um, like you're not there. Like you've been, you're gone. You know, like the last of the Mohicans. There, there's a Mohican tribe. There's lots of Mohicans. Like the people that lived in New York, the Lenape, they're still around. They got moved, but they're not dead. You know, and so a lot of times you'll find this when people want to do like a land acknowledgement. They do it wrong and they say, the people that used to live here, you know, wait a minute, no, that we're still here. So it's a really important question, so I appreciate it. Um, I'll, get, I'll get the first answer and it'll be really short. Uh, I, 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 I think that's a very important question. I am so aged out that, uh, uh, that I can't answer it. I can't, I can't respond to it. Uh, uh, certainly, during the time of the Accord, we were trying to be focused on tribes at that point, uh, not you know, uh, 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 earlier treaties and stuff, but we were really, really focused on where can we go from here, uh, um, and, and, and which meant we needed to know folks at that point, but, but I can't speak to it. I'm six months in San Juan Islands and six months in Arizona, so I'm a... I'll, I'll do a, a little bit. Um, I got silly a couple times and took an appointment to the tribal council when somebody got kicked off or quit. And so I did a, a two years on that. And then I, my kid got on and he wanted me to run with him. So I did. And so I got another two years. And so I finally got off two years ago for good, for good. And in those two years was an, was, um, an eye opener for me too. Um, after being away from tribal government for so long. And I came in, you remember the great big forest fires that was over in uh, our part of the country? I happened to be on the tribal council then. So I, I, I got to see how that operated. And I asked my tribe, can I, can I dig into this? Because it was really poorly managed by the feds. And I'm probably more mad at feds than I am the state uh, because of how they operated in our big forest fires. 
they, they micromanage and they don't even know the land that they're managing. They wouldn't allow uh, 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 our farmers and our loggers who are already in the woods with their heavy equipment to go fight it right at the beginning like we used to. The, if we had uh, eight cats sitting there waiting to put in lines, they wouldn't let them out until they brought in a cat boss that had to be over four cats and the cat boss didn't know the terrain, didn't know the wind patterns, didn't know what the hell they were doing. And we lost over a billion acres of prime timber, board, um, board feet of timber through that process. And so the state heard, uh, DNR heard me complaining about how the fire was managed and they had the same concerns that that I did, so we teamed up and got more. Uh, we got more in, invited uh, with DNR, with the feds, to see what we could do to change how that process works. Because the whole idea of, of having the feds come in is so you can get air support. Well, one little airplane or uh, two little helicopters isn't going to deal with the fire that we had. So it, it took more than that. That's one. The other is the continuation of support for fire and ambulance service. Because we have a, a lot of non-Indians living out in our rural areas, even in, in the mountains, and they don't have uh, any more resources than, than the tribal members have out there. And the, and the county and the cities, they, they can't get there as fast as some of us that have, well, I'll say the, the tribe because we do have a, an ambulance system now on uh, well-trained EMTs that can, and, and we have fire rigs that are, are patrolling, particularly during fire season through the woods. So if there's a structure that's having, you know, starting a fire, we can get a, a, a rig to it a lot faster than the county or the city can. And so we've worked out those kind of situations with, uh, with the local to provide support and protection uh, for, our, for our neighbors and, and for ourselves. And I think that that's been recognized um, because we get invited now to a lot of different functions that we never used to get invited to. Uh, you know, I've been asked to, to sit on uh, panels to interview and select the head or the director of our county mental health programs. I've been asked to sit on uh, review committees of uh, hiring or selecting uh, the hospital administrator for OMAC, a Mid Valley Hospital. That never happened before, but it only happens after you, I guess you earn your way to the, to the table, right? Because you can prove that you can produce, and you can do it in a good way, not us and them, you and me. It's we're all in. Like I said earlier, we're all in this together. When you're out there, particularly in the rural areas, I don't. I can't even comprehend what I would could do here, you know, with the city and in the little Puyallup tribe or the Muckleshoot tribe. I would. I wouldn't have a clue. I. I. I'm. I'm more. Ron Allen, uh, of course, we got some families that are as big as his tribe, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Ron, would you like to respond? So what he's really saying is you can put my reservation in the Colville parking lot. So, uh, well, um, uh, it, it's an interesting question. Um, and uh, from my perspective, it's layered. Um, uh, I. Uh, Part of what I've been doing over my career is uh, learning and understanding, observing the, the different generational value systems and and how they are different. Uh, you know, so I, I personally am, am, am from the the, the uh, um, well. My dad was a silent generation, and then, then I I was the uh, uh, the um, I'm drawing a blank on it. Boomer. Uh, right. Say it again. Boomer. Boomer generation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and then you know the 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 yeah. X generation and so forth. But every one of them, when you start learning about them, they have different value systems and 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 they're cyclical. And so you try to figure out you know uh, you know understand that in your own community, uh, not only only your own people, but the people around you. 
Then your cross-cultural component of your question, um, where while we are having our, our, our renaissance of, of restoring our values and traditions and languages, et cetera, which is quite successful throughout our various communities, <clears throat> then we, inter then we uh, politically, we engage in the other ethnicity groups. So, uh, you know, the Laraza group, you know, the Hispanic group, you know, or you deal with the Asian uh, uh, organizations and entities, African Americans and so forth, and you, and you, you find the, the common ground, you, you have a common interest. In, and we, to any country, taking a very aggressive lead because of our indigenous standing in, in Washington State, get these longhouses built in, in middle of universities. Well, that's where you find this diversity of cultural values and, and ethnicities um, that have unique uh, um, views of the world and, 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 and practices and where you can exchange them. So one of the things we advocate is it's not just about educating uh, the, the general population and, and about who we are as indigenous people and, and what we're all about, but it's also to engage with other ethnicity groups where they are and what their value system is. So set aside these generational ch ch changes, then you then you got these ethnicity ch uh, uh, values that come from all over the world. And our universities and colleges are quite good at recruiting um, talent from all over the world. So so we become that become that becomes a value for us as well. I see it happening. I encourage it. So it's not just about understand us. It's about understand the unique values uh, of of all these ethnicity groups. And we engage politically with them because we have common cause. But to do it in a way that is not threatening to the non-Indian sector, that is equally complicated because what's your heritage? You know, where do your roots go back? You know, and uh, so everybody gets, not everybody, many people get, get caught up in ancestry and all that. What's my roots, you know? Well, everybody has roots. So we come from an indigenous perspective. And that's our angle. And then how do we, how do we uh, interface that? The challenge for us, quite frankly, is, is, is trying to prepare our next generations to take the leadership and keep the momentum going in, in that constructive direction. And just, that's just my view. Mel. One little part that I, that I forgot, uh, and it's not just us, us and people like us talking to you or, and other audiences, it's talking to our own audience, our own people. Because we're a generation of, uh, my, my grandparents lived through a hell of a lot worse than my parents. My parents lived through a hell of a lot worse than I lived through. And then when my kids were young, um, people wouldn't talk to them because of me being on the tribal council saying, this is our water, this is our creek, and we're, we're going to zone it. We'll give you, you know, we'll recognize your, your rights and your opportunity to, to own, but so it was tough for my, my own children. Uh, and so at least I was involved. So my, I had my kids to talk to and explain why they were being treated like that. Other families don't have that, that ability, but they see the reaction and action of their parents or their grandparents, which isn't very positive, And they're carrying on that negative like I was like I was today. And so I think it's, um, I try to do it, and some of us still try to do it, or the elderly part of our, our communities try to talk to our young people about, yeah, that happened in the past. Here's why, why your mom and dad and your grandpa and grandma are like this, but here's what the future is. Here's where we are now because of things that's been going on. And so here's your opportunity. Um, and go to school. We, we spend a lot of time trying to educate our own communities that it don't have to be all negative, that we have a lot of positive um, history too now that we could take advantage of and you have to carry it on. And so when I go talk to high school kids and grade school kids, my, my and I'm, I got half of it done. When I get old, I'd want to be a fat old man sitting on my porch knowing that you young people are going to take care of me. Well, I got old and I got fat. Now I just got to make sure that they take care of me, right? And, and so I, I think that's just as equally important to educate our own 
about the future and what's possible as it is to go out and preach all of the bad stuff that's happened in the past. If I hope that helps. Great. We're going to wrap up with the questions. Um, I would say, you know, when you think about tribes, one of the very basic things to understand is we say the United States, but the United States is a confederacy and it's of states, territories, I mean, we've got Guam, Puerto Rico, and tribes. You know, we're, we all form this, this giant confederacy, but we're governments and people forget that. And, and if you drop into just race, you'll miss a point when you're working in government you, you really kind of got to keep it forefront that you're working with tribes because they're another government of equal or greater standing at times than, say, a county. And so that's really important because if you don't treat it that way, you will offend other races. And, you know, we're well aware of that. But we are also a race. But you can look at the graduation, you know, from a little bit of white hair, a little, little darker, a little darker, and then the guy on the end. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, we're all different. We all have different citizenship rules. But, but, but at the base, remember, you know, we're just another government. And you know how government works. You're in government. Can I say one thing? No, we're out of time. I, I know. Um, one of the things, you know, a lot of people talk about the gaming industry, and of course, you know it's huge here in, in Pierce County, uh, in Tacoma. Um, and Rebecca uh, George over here, who's, who is the executive director for our Washington Indian Gaming Association, I'm the chair, and uh, we produce these reports that show what we do in our respective communities. So they're, 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 uh, Bruce is holding it up there. So if you want to grab a couple, it, it shows you yeah. what we do in Indian country, why gaming and, and diversification of our economic portfolio has made a difference for our people and for our community. So. Um, I think it, you'll find it very informative. Uh, if you have a time, take a look at it. And Bobby, if I, if I could say real quickly, that, 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 uh, uh, not only is it a con uh, uh, confederacy, he can, uh, uh, also tribes are, are uniquely governed differently from each other. Um, yeah. Some it's the business council, some it's the tribal council, some it's the elders. Some, I mean, I mean, and so, so you can't go into working with a tribe assuming you understand how their government works. And the tribes we found had to, had to learn the other way too. Well, why can't you tell the secretary of state what to do? You know, you're the governor. Uh, uh, and and so, so you, you have to be careful uh, uh, in, in working with a tribe to understand to let them tell you what their structure is for government to government. Yeah. You can't figure it out. Call Bobby. That's what he does. That's his day job. <laughs> it it kind of is. Um, could you give us a closing, please? You bet. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, Mel, thank you for your service to our military. And I really like your hat, by the way. I really <laughs> like They all know I served in the Navy as well. And, and in this community, we got a lot of Army and a lot of Air Force, so the Navy guys need to stick together. So that's <laughs> um, in, our, in our culture, this is very normal and a great honor. Thank you, sir. See how I've changed, Jim? <laughs> I am honored. Thank you. I'm honored. And I want to thank you three in particular. I want to thank you for being bold enough, for seeing opportunity to, to lead at a pivotal time of change. I know and understand, and I'm sure the people in here know and understand, that that action you took was risky. It was risky. You, you were stepping forward, and there were going to be plenty of detractors all around you, in Indian country, in the state, throughout. And you stepped up to leadership because you saw what could happen. And I hope you are justifiably proud at the change that has come from that. So I want to thank you very much on behalf of Pierce County, on behalf of the citizens of the state of Washington, on behalf of 
my tribal partners and neighbors in Pierce County, we are all better off for what you were bold enough to do. And the words that you said today, right, sovereignty, mutually respectful relationships, common cause, agree where you can, but you won't always agree. Those are the same things that happen to us and, and are important to us today. And I appreciate the comment about every, every tribe is different. We, we have the privilege of dealing with four tribes here in Pierce County. Um, and they are all a little different, and they make us better. But I will tell you that one of the things, the mutually respectful relationship, common cause, the thing that impresses me, among other things, is with the local tribes, we are working together on fishery and environmental issues, but we are working together on economic development issues, on human service issues, on crime and justice issues. And those are issues that we all have together for our, the betterment of all of us. So they are tremendous partners in that. Um, in those issues, we may not always be perfectly aligned, but we're not too far apart. And then there may be some that we're, we can't agree on, but most of them, we are aligned, maybe just not perfectly aligned as we move forward to, for the betterment of all the people in Pierce County. So I hope that challenges you um, to think about them. I hope you, I, I, Sarah Colleen, thank you again for, for putting this on. It is incredible. I hope you appreciate the time that you got to see and hear firsthand from people who created and made history in the state of Washington and showed what could be done that was very different than how things were happening. Uh, as we close, that's a challenge to all of us to live up to that and to, and to model that, to remember mutually respectful relationships, find common cause, a address the issues that are so important to all the people in Pierce County. So it, it, it is, this has been just tremendous. And I'm, I hope that you have a little bit of time. If you have a, another issue or you would like to talk to them, I hope they will be able to stay around for a few minutes afterwards. So again, gentlemen, thank you very much. We are, we are honored and appreciate your service. Can I get you up here, Sarah? Okay, perfect. Sarah Colleen. Just a couple comments, because I wanted to get up here not to say anything, um, but I was going to shake the hands of these great people. Um, I respect, honor, I don't want to obey, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I I worked with Dick Thompson. I worked in DSHS when Dick Thompson was in DSHS. I worked in DSHS when Mel Tanaskett was in DSHS. There were a couple of times I was concerned, because I think I was one of the first tribal liaisons, along with Mel, um, in DSHS. And I was way down in the bowels, I guess, of my organization. I said I kept having to go up through these glass ceilings and I was complaining to Mel and he's probably he doesn't even know this I'm sure uh, or remember it I was complaining to him saying I have to report to the director I have to be on that management team I have to be there when they make decisions on legislation and on policy because I'm tired of going through these individuals um, every time I want to make a change in tribal. And at that time I was working in child support and in tribal TANF. And of course I was just whining, right? I used to whine to uh, Joe Dela Cruz and he would hear nothing of it. He just said, you know what? I didn't tell you it was gonna be easy and you're a soda mission, you can't quit. 
But, you know, I got to whine to Mel. <laughs> but anyway, next thing I knew, I was reporting to the director. And I knew that Mel had made those changes internally, you know, without probably anybody's knowledge. Um, I've worked with Bobby a lot. Uh, he's had a couple contracts with my tribe. He probably still does. And I was on the Enterprise Board. And he does a lot of training. So check his website because there's training, more training on tribal there. So I'm giving you a plug. Uh, and I've heard so much about Ron and fisheries and, and you know, he's an amazing person. Maybe he was young back then, but, you know, he learned from the, the great leaders. And I'm just so appreciative, I hope you guys are too, that, you know, to have this opportunity to hear these individuals and their successes and their challenges and, and their positiveness, but also some of the realities. Um, and I'm so appreciative for everyone that has come to this training. You know, I recognize just about nearly everyone, and I hope we take it to heart. And the Accord is a model. And like Indian Child Welfare Act, it's the gold standard. So we couldn't go wrong working on implementing and in institutionalizing a government-to-government -government process. So um, you did get a picture in, in the, the notebook about with Joe and myself. I had to do it because he was also my tribal chairman and my mentor. And when I was working at DSHS, he was the first one to step up to the plate and support me. And he even went to tribal uh, conferences and said, listen to her. She's got something very important to say. And, and so of all these individuals, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that Joe can't be here, but um, he was an amazing person. And I think he will always be remembered. I think he's one of the, amongst these guys, you know, one of the greatest, you know, tribal leaders nationally in our time. And I hope someday you'll be recognized. Maybe I'm going to be the one they have to make it happen. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs>